Welcome back to the Hill Update. My name is Dean Allison, a member of Parliament for Niagara West. And welcome back to part two as we talk about natural immunity and uh, COVID-19. Joining me on the show today is Dr. Caro, who is a professor at University of Guelph, where he has been for the last 19 years and teaches research in the areas of immunotoxicology and immunogenetics. He has published in over 186 publications that have been res uh, referenced by thousands. We also have Dr. Stephen Pel 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 Pelletier, who is a graduated with his PhD in biochemistry from UBC and continued his work and his postdoctoral work in Scotland at the University of Dundee and at the Howard Hughes Medical Center. Gentlemen, welcome to the show and welcome back to part two. We were talking about natural immunity, what it is, why it's important, and uh, why it's important as it relates to COVID-19. So let's start right back there uh, in that conversation in terms of why is natural immunity so important as it relates to COVID-19? Um, I'll start off, I guess, in this. Um, it's, uh, it's important because some of us in the population will have already been protected. And so um, we might uh, become exposed, but have very mild symptoms and recover. And so if you look at the number of the people that actually end up in the hospital or in the ICU, um, that's a, a very small minority of the whole population. Um, the pr problem is that this pandemic is global. And so when you look at uh, on a global scale, the number of people around the world, now you're talking a large number of people that actually end up in the hospital ICU and dying. Dr. Pellock, yeah. did you want to add to that? Yes. Um, so that's the real question is how much immunity is there actually already in our country, especially after coming up to almost pretty soon to two years of this pandemic? And the answer is, as far as I can tell, is that we can use different estimates. One is using the PCR test, which has been sort of a measure for how many people have actually been infected in Canada, somewhere well over 6% of the population has tested PCR positive. And we know that that number is a, is a fraction of the number that we expect are actually infected. And the US CDC estimates at least four times that number. So we have a minimum number of 25% or more of the population that has been infected and should have antibodies against the virus. On top of that, from talking with my colleagues at i Blood Services in Alberta, where they've tested unvaccinated people, they estimate that 40% of the people that they test using a test from the Mayo Clinic um, in the US actually have natural immunity. And then in our lab with our tests, which is actually much more sensitive, we're getting closer to about 80% or more of the people that we test that are healthy, that aren't aware of being previously infected with the virus, as testing positive with antibodies. So we think that both with the people that have been vaccinated, everyone that we've checked pretty much that's been vaccinated already has antibodies against the other SARS-CoV proteins in addition to the spike protein, which is what they should have antibodies against. So we, we appear to see that most people that have been vaccinated actually already had natural immunity in the first place. And many of the people that have not been vaccinated most of them already have natural immunity. And I know this is very controversial, um, but we have very sensitive tests and we've now tested probably close to 1200 people. And uh, that number is growing from across Canada. And we're seeing the same phenomenon that we've seen in Vancouver, basically happening in, for example, Toronto with the help of Dr. Carroll and, and his team out there where we've been testing people in the University of Guelph area. So we've got about a minute left in the segment. And I guess the other thing that makes it, uh, makes the natural immunity good is that it, it does last quite a while. I mean, that's the other thing that Absolutely. I'm seeing from the studies is that uh, it does go on for some period of time. Some people think as many, as long, as much as 80 years in looking at antibodies and people that had the influenza flu in 1918, uh, towards their, their 90s years later, they found that they still had natural immunity. So natural immunity can last for decades, not just years. Great. Okay, when we come back for break, we're going to talk about, you know, we've had a lot of uh, issues around frontline workers losing their job. And we know that frontline workers have been exposed uh, probably to COVID during the, the time that they've been uh, doing their nursing and all those things. 
Let's talk about their natural immunity when we come back from break. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Uh, why is natural immunity so important, uh, important to frontline workers like nurses? There was a study done, it was called The Necessity of COVID-19 Vaccination in Previously Infected Individuals in the Cleveland Clinic, June 19th, 2021. The study talked about involving 1,359 previously SARS-CoV-2 infected healthcare workers in the Cleveland Clinic system, where not one single one of them was reinfected 10 months into the pandemic. Despite some of these individuals being around COVID positive patients from more than the, more than the regular population. Uh, Steve, so let, let's talk about that. Why is that such a big deal? You know, we've got a lot of mandates over here where we're getting rid of people as nurses, frontline workers. That study to me uh, seems to say that we need to be looking at what natural immunity is all about here. That study is not surprising whatsoever. Um, we know that these people that are on the front lines, the people that we told were heroes a year ago, we're telling them that they're dispensable because they won't get vaccinated. And, and many of them know, they're very intelligent people, that they already have natural immunity. If any segment of the population is going to have this natural immunity, it's the front healthcare, frontline healthcare workers. And so what's happening is they are also seeing the vaccine injury that's occurring. And that that spooks them as well. And so they also recognize that this strategy, that there's, there's potential damage from these, uh, these vaccines, that they, they are taking a stand, many of them, not to get vaccinated because they are concerned for themselves. But I think they're also trying to send a clear message to the general public that, that we should be paying more attention to the risks associated with these vaccines particularly the vaccines, the, these experimental ones that use RNA or adenoviruses to deliver genetic material, so that you use your own body cells to actually mimic being a virus to then have an immune attack that Dr. Caro talked about, this inflammatory response, that every time that you get vaccinated again, the chances of that vaccine injury escalates. It's not just increases by, by, by the extra time is actually uh, dramatic increases with each vaccination that you have, that your inflammatory response, you can start making potentially antibodies against your own body cells, and that can precipitate eventually autoimmune diseases. This is a recipe in order to get autoimmune diseases, is repeated inflammatory responses against your own tissues. Um, Dr. Carroll, one of the things we're seeing, uh, study after study is coming out talking about the fact that once you have it, you've had COVID-19, you're, you're immune. It's what we're talking about today. I see another study that you guys referenced uh, at the CCCA, which was um, 600,000 totally recovered COVID-19 patients. And unlike the vaccine up to, up to four to six months, they found no study reporting of an increase of risk of reinfection over time. So here you have nurses that possibly have had it uh, this before, and the actually it, it seems to be from the studies that the chances of reinfection are actually fairly low. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, well, first of all, it's, it's very impressive. It's an example of how robust the immune response can be. Um, when you think of these uh, frontline workers, they're in a high stress job. And uh, stress will also affect how well their immune response is, and yet they're still showing that they've got protection. So I think that that's a, a really positive story, and it's too bad we're not hearing about that. Yeah, I think go ahead. The example of the natural immunity that probably these people acquired is illustrated in two cases. I'd like to just briefly mention. One is looking at Israel, a highly vaccinated population, where there. 90% of the people that are actually in hospital are double vaccinated individuals. And they do find that with a third shot, they're having protection that's tenfold better than being naturally, than, sorry, than being double vaccinated. Natural vaccination there is less than 1% of these people in hospital. Now you take the situation in India, which we heard about where all these deaths were occurring in May and June, and when you actually look at the data in terms of per capita, 
the the death rate there was about the same as in Ontario and the rest of Canada. So they have a very large population and they got hit at about the same time. But what's really fascinating is that now that the months have gone by, there's been a, a, a huge drop in the number of deaths and even cases of COVID-19 in India. Now in that population, less than 15% of it is actually vaccinated. So that protection that came was actually from natural immunity. And that's obviously cannot be attributed to the vaccine in, in that country. We're gonna come back after break and continue that. Welcome back to the Hill Update. Before break, we were just talking about, uh, you know, nurses and people have built up immunity. Question I have is, uh, do you recommend that people get the vaccinated after they have had natural immunities? And we're seeing that. And the other question I have in terms of, I've heard, what, what is kind of the response of natural immunities versus uh, immunities from the vaccination? I've heard seven, 10, 13 times better. Is there any response you guys have to that, that question as we look at that? Okay, well, to address the first question, Dean, about uh, should we get vaccinated after you have uh, natural immunity? Um, I think at some point in time, um, policymakers are going to have to decide how, how often are we going to get vaccinated and are we going to continue this process of vaccination every six months? Um, the intent of these vaccines was to prevent people from dying, and they seem to be effective at doing that. But at some point in time, um, we have to be able to accept and trust that our own immune system is going to effectively protect even people who've been vaccinated. Um, and so that's something to consider. Would we bother getting vaccinated after we've had natural immunity? I would say no. Uh, are you going to ex be exposed to uh, SARS-CoV-2 again? Yes, you will likely will be, and you'll likely have the protection. The immune system needs constant triggering with antigens to be able to mature and learn as the pathogen changes. And if we don't do that, then we're going to continue having this problem. Stephen, I, oh, I would add to that with what Neil is saying is correct, and that I completely agree that if you've got natural immunity, there's there's no point. And when you're in a pandemic, this virus is very contagious. It's it's everywhere. The people that have natural immunity are being re-exposed and they're actually getting natural booster shots. Exactly. So it's not necessary for them to go out and get vaccinated in such a way that they can have potential harm from, again, this inflammatory response against your own tissues. So I think it's a good idea, basically, um, not if you if you are at risk, it may make sense to get vaccinated. So there are certain groups where we would recommend this. But for most of the population that's healthy, we, we wouldn't recommend this. And so it's, it's one of those things where I think you need to, um, with, a, with a vaccination, you want to do it, but don't do it at a time when the virus is actually in its peak in, in, the, in the pandemic, where you're in a, in, a, in a wave. There, there's a chance of, and we, we're concerned about this, this we call it antibody dependent enhancement, that actually vaccinating and getting back to it at a time when the virus is very prevalent, you may actually make the situation worse for some people. We don't know how many, uh, we don't know the extent of this uh, antibody dependent enhancement, but in animal studies with other coronaviruses, we know that that actually can reduce your immune system. The immune cells take in the, um, the virus when it's with certain antibodies in a way that instead of digesting those viruses, what they do is allow them to propagate inside those cells and then kill those, those uh, immune cells. So the ideal time to vaccinate is when you don't have the virus around. So in insisting that healthcare workers go out at, at a height of a peak in, a, in this, this wave this is bad in terms of increasing their probability of actually getting sick. Uh, it also is bad that it's forcing many of the nurses to decide this is the end of their careers at a time when we need those nurses and healthcare workers to not only fight 
you know, uh, basic COVID-19, but all the other diseases that are happening, especially as we go into the, the winter uh, season when more people tend to be sicker. Uh, just to add to that, we, we seem to be thinking about this like we do with the flu. The flu is seasonal and it makes sense to vaccinate for the flu before the flu season comes. In this case, as Steve says, this pathogen is around us all the time. There is no point once you've already had immunity or have already been vaccinated to continue with this vaccine program for those people. Very good. All right, well, we're gonna come back. Uh, we're gonna have the final segment when we come back from break. We're gonna talk a bit about how we can find out what our natural immunities are like. I would love the, an answer to that question about uh, how much better natural immunity is versus vaccinated immunity, if you guys have any thoughts on that. So when we come back from break, we'll have a look at those two things. Welcome back to the Hill Update. We're talking about natural immunity today and uh, what it is and how it works and if it's, is it better than looking at vaccines? Just before break, we were talking about um, natural immunity as in terms of how, how much better is that than, you know, if your body can create the natural immunity versus vaccines. Any thoughts on that, gentlemen, in, in terms of where we're at? Sure. I mean, you can look at the data, basically, where we have people that have been vaccinated that are in hospital and unvaccinated people that are in hospital, but also people who've had COVID and are in hospital. And it turns out that when you look at those numbers, it's usually around 1% of those cases. So you could argue, I think, based on multiple sources, that I would say natural immunity is 100 times better than actually vaccine-induced immunity on many different accounts, but in terms of actual hospitalization and, and deaths. Any thoughts of that, uh, Neil? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think you need to also think about age too. In the case of uh, immune compromised or elderly people, um, it makes sense to vaccinate them. Uh, in the case of younger people, I'm gonna say younger than me, but uh, younger people that are healthy and, and uh, have a robust immune response, then natural infection makes a lot more sense to me for those people. And as far as children goes, um, you know, we already know the literature is very strong that the children don't have severe adverse reactions. Many of them are asymptomatic. So it would make sense to naturally expose those children rather than put them at risk of an adverse reaction after vaccination for this vaccine. And I, I would a series of vaccines. I would add that the actual, actual risks to people that are 18 and under in Canada statistically is about one in 100,000 that will end up in hospital and one in a million that might die. Yeah. Okay, so, so I mean, when you see that, you know, it, it's clear there are much greater risk of actually vaccine injury than the virus. So what, yes. would, what, would be, what would be the next steps then in terms of, how would you find out if you had natural immunity? Because I, you know, one of the studies that, that you guys had in the report was that there was a, asymptomatic people that actually ended up with immunity. So in other words, they probably didn't even know they were exposed and, uh, and ended up with some natural immunity through the process. So how would, how would, what would be options for people to find this out? Well, certainly anybody who's already tested PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, you can be pretty, you have much greater confidence that they actually have immunity than someone who's been vaccinated and a few months later. Um, so I would certainly, if you're gonna have these kind of mandates and, and passports, which you know I'm dead set against myself, if you're gonna do it though, you should be recognizing the people who've already been injured by COVID. We don't need to double injure them again with these uh, mandatory vaccinations. So, and then there are tests and we should do a better job. I mean, Conexus, the information that we've developed, we're, we're, we're gonna publish it in open peer reviewed journals and anybody can take what we've developed and utilize it to develop more tests. So I think, this is what we should be focused on more is actually determining who's got natural immunity if it's going to be a important but frankly i think it's so high in the population anyways we may very well have already been close to achieving what we call herd immunity so 
I don't think really this is even necessary, this course that we're on right now. Neil, do you have any final thoughts? Yes, I agree. And, uh, you know, they're talking about a third set, set of boosters for um, the elderly. That might make sense for the elderly. But if they go beyond that, you see in Israel, they're vaccinating everybody with the third shot. Um, uh, I totally agree with Stephen. It would make more sense to test antibody response, make sure that people have a good titer and redirect those vaccines to populations that don't even have access to single vaccine yet. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other final, final thoughts, Stephen? Well, I'm, I have to say that I'm kind of disappointed by how Canadians have reacted to this uh, in the sense that we have a segment of the population that's unvaccinated, that's being highly discriminated against. I mean, right through to where they can go, uh, they're being fired from jobs because they refuse to be vaccinated for, for actually good reason. And I, I, the tolerance that I'm seeing in Canadians towards this isn't something that I would have expected, frankly. And in, in, in the time, you know, I'm, I'm born in this country, my family's been here for several generations, and I've never really seen this kind of thing in my lifetime. The discrimination that I'm seeing at a time when we're supposed to be more enlightened with diversity and equity and inclusion, it seems like we're just ignoring this for a very large segment of our population right now. Well, listen, uh, Stephen, Neil, Thank you very much for joining me today on the show. 